from many places we have come, with hearts broken open by grief and love we have come, seeking solace and friends to share our memories we have come. Through the door and through the web we have come to this sacred space, a witness to the sorrows and joys of generations, a vessel for our laughter and our tears. We come together in this sacred time, each of us a unique and beautiful piece of Beth's story, stitched together through the bonds of friendship and the passage of time, connected to create an integrated whole. Spirit of life and love, God of those who love and mourn, be with us in this time, be with us in this place, as we remember and celebrate the life of Beth Ann O'Donnell. Good afternoon. I am the Reverend Heather Janulis. On behalf of Beth's family and the Winchester Unitarian Society community, it is my honor as the parish minister to welcome each and all to this celebration of Beth and her life. Whether you're here at our historic sanctuary or connecting through our live stream, it is good for us to be together. I especially wish to acknowledge Beth herself, who was the primary architect of today's service. This is one of her many gifts to us. There are a few practical things we should know. For those who are live streaming, you can find a PDF of the Memorial Order of Service on the front page of our website. Go to www.winchesteruu Org and look in the upper right-hand corner. We are optimistic that we can offer a reception on the Bell Tower Terrace immediately after the service. This is, of course, dependent on good weather. We will let you know at the end of the service whether we are gathering there or whether each will be given a handmade treat at the door to take home and enjoy. If we are gathering on the terrace, those with mobility challenges can access the terrace by exiting through the main street doors and moving along the path parallel to the building toward the Mystic Valley side. If you are local and live streaming and we are having the reception, you can come over and join us. We just ask that you sign in when you arrive on the unlikely event we need to engage in contact tracing. Our live stream system depends on the Wi-Fi network in the building. If you are here in the sanctuary, please turn off your cell phone so we can give all of our bandwidth to the tech deck. Let us now continue the service by lighting the chancel chalice. In our gathering, let us remember that we are not alone. While we have come to remember and celebrate one life, we carry the weight of other losses. Holding grief for many and grief for one is natural. Remembering others in our cloud of witnesses is natural, too. In honor of the many ways Beth O'Donnell touched our lives, and in honor of countless others who also gone but not forgotten helped us become who we are, we dedicate our chancel chalice with these words by Albert Schweitzer. They'll be read by Amelia O'Donnell, and the chalice will be lit by Will O'Donnell. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. This is a reading, a poem, by Daniel Landinsky, inspired by the poet Tukaram Maharaj. My name is Fritzi Nace, and I was in one of Beth's covenant groups. This is called a fancy event. I was invited to a fancy event. And when I got there, one of the guests said, Tukaram, your shirt is on backwards, and so are your pants. And it looks like your hair never heard the word comb and your shoes don't match either. 
I replied, thanks, I noticed that all before leaving, but why try to fool anyone? Now, please join me in rising and singing hymn number 311, one of my favorite, Let There Be a Dance. When considering her memorial service, Beth knew that she didn't want a traditional eulogy, but more of a series of reflections of soul sketches, highlighting elements of her personality and character. Our first soul sketch will be offered by her son, Kevin. Food has always taken center stage for my family. Regular family dinners, morning coffee, Saturday croissants for Mamadou's. Thanksgiving was always our biggest holiday. More than just enjoying good food, we love to cook together, shop together, and just talk food. Over the years, we developed an unofficial family ethos. Food made from scratch with love is always the best. Over the past years, my mom and I were able to spend a lot of time together, whether it's sitting, having coffee in the morning, late night chats after dinner, trying out a new restaurant, couple of trips that we had the opportunity to take. While the conversations were in no way limited to food, it was a central tenet. Beth loved cooking, she loved eating, good smells, rich tastes, meaningful conversations shared over coffee, always with heavy cream, or just time spent talking and laughing late into the nights with friends, families, or even strangers. For us, food was one of our strongest shared passions. We both love to cook, we both love to eat, both love to cook for other people. It's clear to me that the healthiest food is the food that brings us together, brings us closer, nourishes our souls. At least that's how I justify the heavy cream. <laughs> Through all of our time spent in the company of good food, I learned a lot about how to cook, but I also learned a lot about my mom's philosophies in life. She always taught me to be here now, to be present in the moment, to cherish every dinner with loved ones, to enjoy cooking a grilled cheese on a random Saturday afternoon, 
or the three days of prep work it takes to deliver one of those Thanksgiving feasts. She taught me to always show love, no matter what you're making or who you're making it for, make it with love. No matter the interaction, approach, sorry, no matter the interaction, approach it with compassion and empathy. And remember, sometimes bringing someone a hot meal is the simplest and kindest thing you can do. Think, but also act. I definitely get lost in the weeds when I'm, I'm doing all my research for cooking. At the end of the day, you still have to make dinner. But more so, the unconditional kindness is a radical spiritual practice. Uh, both receiving and giving kindness is food for spiritual growth. I can't say how much, it, how much it has meant to me, all the kind words and delicious meals that people have brought us over the last few months, a few years, really. Finding joy in simple activities, while Michelin stars and the latest hot restaurant are amazing, the joy from a simple meal with friends can't be beat. Making pancakes for dinner is not only encouraged, uh, sorry, it's not only okay, it's encouraged. Embrace the shadows and move into the light. Life's not always easy, it's not supposed to be. Embrace the tough times and always remember the happy times. For her, I think food and hospitality were two sides of the same coin. They go hand in hand. Good food is meant to be shared and spending time with people is always better with good food. So please know this first, the kitchen is my happy place. Second, for me, cooking is an act of love. And finally, I hope we get to eat something together soon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sue Brokaw, a member of the Winchester Unitarian Society and at least a 10-year participant in Beth O'Donnell's and Kim Tracy's small group ministry, also called a covenant group. The small group ministries are led by laypersons. They are part of the unseen magic of our church. Around 2004, the Winchester Unitarian Society initiated these small groups that would gather for theme-based discussions. Many have morphed or disbanded due to life changes and interests. Our group has changed members but has kept a good core set of eight to 10 participants. Some 10 years ago, it was suggested to me by then current minister that I might wish to join one of these small groups or covenant groups. I had never heard of this program during my first years attending this church. What luck for me to have a monthly gathering with other church members to share thoughts, reflect, and gain insights into our lives and the greater world around us. What better luck to have Kim and Beth as our alternating facilitators. Yes, we had the ultimate blessing of Beth as our group leader. Her wealth of reading fueled wonderful ideas that launched deep, interesting discussions. Beth loved the Sufi poet Rumi. Mary Oliver, authors, authors of diver, as diverse as Parker Palmer, Brene Brown, Anne Lamott, Ursula Le Guin. Um, if I could get a copy of the bookshelf library at the Smith O'Donnell household, I'd appreciate that. Uh, yes, we had, most importantly, Beth would be outspoken, challenging us, giving us a counter thought we hadn't considered. None of us who have been in this small group will ever forget her candor about her cancer condition. Beth was honest in her discussion of life and her unavoidable early approaching death. She has blessed us all, giving us a window into her world and perhaps a beginning toward accepting our own fate. <clears throat> I wish to describe for you one of our two-hour sessions. <clears throat> After lighting the chalice, our time of centering, a conversation starting quote is read aloud, usually by the facilitator. Our topics range from forgiveness, connection, and inspiration to food and pets. <clears throat> then we each take turns with a five minute or so check-in a time to speak while others listen. We each give a brief update of where we are in life. This is done with trust, 
honesty, confidentiality, and no cross-talking. Yep, zero interruptions. <laughs> Difficult. <clears throat> this is when the non-speakers are nurturing their listening skills. As theologian Rebecca Parker put it, there is a quality of listening that is possible among a circle of human beings who by their attentiveness to one another create a space in which each person is able to give voice to the truth of his or her life. There is the miracle of authentic narrative made possible by listening that holds still long enough to let our truth be told. The ideas explored during our two-hour session are ones I often share with others outside the church, perhaps with family at dinner or with friends, while still honoring our covenant of privacy. Today I share with you the beautiful on-target prayer Beth wrote titled Covenant Group Prayer. We gather with gratitude for the blessing of companionship, to share our joys and sorrows, to trust that we can be known and accepted as we are in our shadows as well as our radiance. We do not journey alone. Together, we are a community of seekers. We create a sacred space where it is safe to explore the raw places we must trek through to find our souls. We become strong in the broken places. As we strive to find our authentic voices, we bear witness for one another, serving compassionately as instruments of truth-telling we offer each other the gift of undivided attention. We trust that no one will try to fix us, knowing that we are most helpful when we listen deeply so that each of our inner teacher's wisdom can emerge. Together we explore our hidden wholeness and live divided no more. We seek meaning, purpose, and passion in living each day and long to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We celebrate the mystery that forms our being. In loving unconditionally, we are vessels for evolving spirit. We pray in partnership with the spirit of life that we may co-create a vision of reality large enough to, be, to embrace us in our frail humanity so that we may grow into our divine light. Beth, you did not journey alone.
I'm not Sarah Delano. <laughs> I'm best daughter Catherine. There are places that seem to expect us, to take us in like pilgrims from the way ahead, to tell us suddenly and without fanfare of a new beginning made out of nothing but the way we got here, as if the hard road of difficulty and despair and minor triumph that brought us here could make sense simply by the nature of a particular geographic welcome. Like this spur of olive grove overlooking the Val de Pizis, its upright stones cradled on the ridge by a surrounding hollow so that the tomb feels like two hands cupped together holding the flow of remembrance. So that we drink the never ending spring hardly knowing what we drink and look out at the quiet groves not knowing what we see. Taking the cup from our ancestors as they took it from their ancestors and their ancestors before them each generation first grieving and then respecting, forgetting and then remembering again how the chain of life is forged, how what we love and leave behind becomes more real to others because we hold it knowing how it flows away and in a place like this, each of us <coughs> can recall the clear memory of a young son or a growing daughter or a good friend let go into the world. Recall a parent who watched over us, year after year who blessed us simply by asking after us, who watched us in our youthful affections as our hands folded in newness next to our hearts. Caught in the surprising tide that traps us and freed us from ourselves, the secret harvest growing inside, the ripening, uncaring blossom of desire that disturbed our quiet hours and the night invitations of lovers never to return. And then, and only then, in looking back, the sudden miraculous sense of the circle that made us whole. The sisters or the brothers or the distant cousins we played with as children, the father or the mother or the mothers before mothers, ancestral, handed down, ours. These are the first two stanzas of David White's poem, Etruscan Tomb, from his 2012 book of poetry, Pilgrim. I first read the poem a week after my mother passed. White is one of her favorite poets. These were thoughts she would enjoy, how our communities, filled with family, love, and history, form an ancient shared identity. Today, I share ex excerpts from this poem, hoping that you, too, will feel her presence. We live in cycles. We have beginnings, middles, and ends. If there is a greater beyond, it lies with the knowledge that these cycles are both fleeting and eternal. This was the kind of beauty my mother appreciated. The world of academia offers stimulating debate about art versus craft, high art, and folk art. While American quilt making falls into the latter category, these are arbitrary definitions dictated by academics. My mother's art was about love and expression. She devoted the last five years of her life to making quilts. There are hundreds infused with purpose and love. They embody her desire to wrap friends and family in comfort and remembrance. Her quilts are meant to be used and worn and still they are works of art. Almost all her quilts were made as gifts. In the last three months of my mother's life, the most memorable conversation we had was about creativity. I struggle to articulate my desire to be understood. Sometimes the creative energy is overwhelming, a plea to see me, my joy, anger, pain, and passion. The infamous tension between vulnerability and the undeniable need to express myself. A creative brain was something I shared with my mother. Even in her exhausted state, plagued by active disease and worn down by chemo and radiation, I could see my passion reflected in her face. She said, I feel exactly the same way. My mother's words were indicative of our relationship. I feel the same way. It is a tremendous gift to be so completely understood by a parent. 
in her finer, final months, she said she lived a particularly perfect life. I would say she and I shared a particularly perfect relationship. This acceptance and understanding is rare and precious. I will always feel blessed to have experienced it with her. I envision my mother in the same timeless space Etruscan tomb occupies, filled with family, love, and shared identity. To close, I will read the last three stanzas of the poem. We stop to say a simple word of thanks that we could walk to this place and find it like a promised understanding like an intuition long held that it stood always at the end of the long road. We took to get here as if to welcome us, as if to teach us and hold us in this time, now, to understand at last how close the threshold is that takes us like a blessing from a world we think we know and turns our face to wonder by the gift of a sheer imagined absence the twilight sense of the ultimate purification, to love and let go. Arriving at the tomb, we imagine their lives, and now we try to reimagine ours, becoming, as we stand together, in some sincere remembrance, the promised future inherits their gifts. Thank you. In 2014, the same month Beth's LMS was diagnosed, my dear friend Marcia D. suddenly passed away. Sorry, Katie was a little tough to follow. Reeling from this lesson of how life is both precarious and mysterious, when Beth invited me to spend time with her, I unreservedly said yes. Whether enjoying scrumptious food or iced coffee with her beloved heavy cream, you see a theme here, or cocktails with parent group, or selecting gorgeous fabric for a current quilting project, or simply bumping and laughing our way to radiation. These felt like bonus moments of joy. This was the perfect indulgent gift of simply being together. In late June, Beth went to what we affectionately referred to as La La Land. For several days, she faded away. Fearing we had lost her, to our great relief, Beth reemerged very much herself. I told her that in my despair, I wrote something for your album. She and I had been working together on a photo album of her life and quilts. When I shared it with her, Beth asked me to read it today. I'll do my best. Beth lived over 10% of her life with her LMS diagnosis. She accepted her medical journey and the research it required. Beth navigated her treatment with extraordinary courage, undergoing seven surgeries, plus many and various treatments, protocols, and trials. She never stopped singing the praises of her medical team and Dana Farber. Her team and her understanding gave her confidence. Beth struggled hard and with grace, she knew when to fight and when to nap. Though she hated it, Beth said, my happiness and my life depend on it. Understanding time was short, her passion to create and gift magnificent quilts for family and friends took on an even greater urgency. Her mom, Sharon, would say she was leaving her legacy. Beth graced her friendships and friend groups with her unique presence making the most of each breath, living life with gusto, 
still cracking jokes and chuckling in her knowing way. She said yes to every invitation, outing, and project. She enjoyed her life, incredibly grateful for the family and community who surrounded her, cooked her dinners, and held her hand. Hers was a soul loved deeply and a life lived well. And she told me her life was especially perfect. We will continue to ask ourselves, what would Beth say? Because she rarely went along with the majority. She listened with attention and then gently but confidently gave her own opinion, which was often opposite of what was just said. Another theme. She loved books, poetry, food, her kitchen, and pent water. Beth said, treat people as if they were what they ought to be, and you will help them become what they're capable of becoming. I asked her what thoughts she would share, and she replied, that's been on my mind a lot lately. Be yourself because no one else can do as good a job. And life isn't all roses. We have to accept that better. I guess that's what they call radical acceptance. Remarkably, Beth passed on Marsha D's birthday. Two gorgeous souls finding one another somewhere in the cosmos. Looking back at my time with Beth, I feel comforted and grateful. Friends, family, Maybe it's best when that line is blurred. I'm eternally blessed by our friendship, which extends to Ken, Katie, Kevin, Bill, and Sharon. She treasured you above all else. Beth was memorable in so many ways, and life is more than a little diminished without her, strange even in these early stages of grief. Beth told Katie, Maria loves her people hard, and I am one of her people. She was. She is. May her spunky spirit continue to strengthen us, soothe us, buoy us, and help light our way. Please join me in the responsive reading, We Remember Them, printed in your order of service. I will read the standard type. The community responds with what is in italicized type. Let us begin. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, in the blowing of the wind and the chill of winter, in the opening of buds and the rebirth of spring, in the blueness of the sky and the warmth of summer, in the rustling of leaves and the beauty of autumn, in the beginning of the year and when it ends, when we are weary and in need of strength, when we are lost and sick at heart, when we have joys we yearn to share, so long as we live they too shall live, for they are now a part of us as we remember them. I invite Beth's husband, Ken Smith, to share his soul sketch. The soul sketch will be followed by a minute of shared silence. I'm hoping that this will be uh, easier to read than to listen to everybody else. So uh, this is at least something that's familiar. Okay. Cancer brings <clears throat> terror and anxiety knocking at the front door. For Beth, facing this fear meant employing her most powerful weapon, research. She could not win. While Beth left no stone unturned, in the end, her conclusion was simple. LMS would be a fight to the death, her death. Striving to turn this knowledge into wisdom, she chose to view her cancer not as a life-ending battle, but as a final journey. 
Beth focused not on what she would lose, but on what she might give. Her determination to make and gift beautiful quilts, aiming to wrap her, her friends and family in beauty and warmth, was just the tip of the iceberg. These quilts were small but shining and a visible part of her strategy. By living fearlessly and genuinely, she could bring strength and comfort to those sharing her final days. Never one to sugarcoat, Beth would proudly say, sorry, it's not in me to be cheery and all Pollyanna. All her research and knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, as her research and knowledge became wisdom, she chose courage, dignity, and gratitude as travel companions. Best motto was prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Preparing for the worst meant an unflinching look at what the worst might be. But disease, treatment, and suffering were only half of the story. The other side, hoping for the best, centered on her decision to endure her decline with authentic generosity and grace. For example, Beth made hundreds of trips to Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Hospital. With traffic, COVID screening, waiting and waiting, she never complained. The most negative thing she said was that it was tiring. Yet trip after trip, Beth was warm, welcoming, appreciative of every person from the valet parking assistant to her most eminently qualified medical team members. She faced the difficulty of her illness and its treatment, not with bitterness, but instead with a full and grateful heart. Beth loved and appreciated the people that cared for her. Likewise, many of them loved and appreciated her too. During her final weeks, my family's caring and closeness grew dramatically. The day before she left us, the last time she was herself, Kevin asked her questions about her family. Her last words, I love my parents, I love my brothers, I love my people. While our hearts are broken, our souls have been nourished by the love, the bravery, and the dignity of Beth's cancer journey. Whether young or old, with cancer or perfect health, like Beth, all of our days are numbered. Choice is the everything, and choice is the only thing we have. Faced with incurable cancer, Beth chose to accept her fate in a radical way. She treated pain, dwindling energy, lost mobility, and diminishing independence as inspirations to savor her remaining moments. To navigate these often difficult days, she redefined the four corners of her compass. East, west, and south became courage, grace, and dignity. True north remained loving her people. The fundamental fundamental privilege of humankind is choice. Choosing grace, courage, dignity, and love was her gift to herself and to all of us. Her shining spirit still brings light and warmth to our darkest days. Beautiful and treasured, best quilts are the manifestation of her brave and loving soul. Late in July, Beth visited me in Maine and read me the following letter, written for all of us here today and many who can't be with us. Beth called it her legacy letter. I don't know that I will actually have finished this in time. I've intended to for five years. I would say this has been my expression of denial and we all have our ways of processing hard things. 
Usually, we're sure we're right, but whatever. The takeaway here is that spiritual personal growth doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in the rich soil of human loss, hardship, and tragedy. I've had a hard time imagining what suffering my family and friends have had and will have as a result of my cancer journey. It turns out that this kind of suffering is universal, and I've noticed something important. Those I know who've been through it have amazing resiliency. I'm comforted to know that my family will also get through it. And even more important, they will change and grow because of their loss. This brings me to my second principle. To believe we have control over anything is a human arrogance that distracts us from our important spiritual work of connecting to our inner selves, our community, and the universal core mystery. These connections are experienced best in moments of presence. We can cultivate these moments in many ways, and it should reflect our individual needs. Many people find meditation useful, for example. I think what we like to believe is control is better understood and used as making choices. The more choices we can maintain, the happier we'll be. Being aware of how we function within our choices and how much leverage our choices afford us is the beginning of a life of agency. How we enact our agency is core to who we are and deserves adequate contemplation, a lifetime's worth. My journey has been marked by contemplation, and I think collectively we should turn inward more often. I'm not against action. I just like people to think first, ask questions, listen to others, especially those who are different. Especially the deepest questions that we don't know the answers to, and we might not ever know the answers to for that is where truth resides. Yes, the facts matter, but we're not going to extract truth from facts. I'm not saying truth is conditional, though it may be, but getting to the truth is a grueling process, and often a personal one. When I look back on my life, there are a few things that I know. I am happiest thinking philosophically, especially with a lot of heart. When I think, I like doing it out loud in intimate dialogue with one to seven people. This conversation ideally goes on for many hours to days. If you invite me for a visit, all I need is your attention and willingness to talk. No itinerary needed but good food always helps the process. When I wonder how this predilection serves me, I feel clear. It is a spiritual pursuit. It's about connection. However you connect is practice for all kinds of connection, and eventually you connect to God, however you think of or feel God. For me, it is the enduring universal core mystery, which we can both never understand and never not understand. Somewhere near the center of the core is that felt sense of oneness. In the end, middle, and beginning of my life, I know that love is the most important. Love is that felt sense of oneness. I love you all. I invite us into the spirit of prayer. Spirit of life and love, 
God of memory and of hope. We give thanks for Beth O'Donnell and the beauty, passion, and curiosity she brought to life. As her body is at rest, may our hearts too find peace in the seasons to come. Beth has forever changed us, and we too are forever changed through her loss. In our hardest moments, may the strength of love in this circle and the alchemy of good memories temper the sting of grief. May your presence guide us in the time that remains for us so we, we may too lead lives of abundant welcome, courage, beauty, and love. We ask this in the name of all that is holy. Amen. Let us close with these words by Barbara Peskin. Because of those who came before, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. Because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. Let us go, remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily, to bow to the mystery. Go in peace. Amen. At the conclusion of the post salute, please join me and the family outdoors on the Bell Tower Terrace for a reception.